Adventurers! Welcome back to the Elder Scrolls Lorecast. This is your host, Tom, or Robots. I'm here with my other host, Lotus. Lotus of Doom. Lotus, hey, welcome back, man. How's it going? I, I'm i good. We got Necrom um, on console this week, and I've not had enough time to play, so I'm jonesing to get back to it. <laughs> I can quit anytime I want. I just don't want to quit. <laughs> Yeah, that's how that goes. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome, chat. Thank you for being here. We are digging into more magic-y stuff because last week we talked about the Sigics, and the Sigics are eh, connected in certain ways to the other group of mages that we are more familiar with, the Mages Guild, and we haven't done an episode on them yet, and they're actually connected to another kind of minor location. That'll probably come up in this episode. So we're going through magic-y stuff, which totally makes sense with all of the cool stuff coming to ESO, or at least which has come to ESO with the Necrom expansion and the Arcanist and all of this other weird kind of Hermaeus Mora magic-y stuff going on. So Yeah, some weird tie-ins uh, outside just the normal Mages Guild stuff, uh, ironically, hitting literally right now. <laughs> Yeah, right now for everybody. So we're going to dig into a little bit more about magic. I think this is kind of fun for me, Lotus, because I've been uh, digging back into some of the we we both enjoy the mysteries of Elder Scrolls and the things that they kind of tell you a little bit about. But then you speculate a little bit about it. And yeah. the Mages Guild is kind of in there a little bit they're kind of the most mainline version of say groups of you know mages people who use magic and uh over the over the ages of the world the the different eras they've been more or less accepted in you know unlike certain other groups among say the empire or these different cities yeah. and places so yeah and and you know even acceptance aside um they, you know they've kind of changed how they interact with you or each other or anything else uh going forward through the time span of the series right right so we talked last week about the sigics and how the sigics were doing like this old style of magic this more mysticism guided focus with uh whatever the old gods were or at least a broader pantheon of understanding who the gods and, and beings of this world are and then that was kind of narrowed down by the altmer and then we end up into the second era and here i'm gonna let's let's role play a little bit here lotus you are vanis galarian you are a mage uh, you are right. you are a high elf you uh have been part of the sigics you feel like more pretentious by the minute this is yeah great in fact you, i mean you probably were pretty pretentious you were a very powerful mage and um you knew who manny marco was and b before he well he was always kind of a douche and kind of evil, evil but before he went like super evil you you went through that whole situation mm -hmm, with him mm -hmm. him taking that that knowledge and using it for very nefarious means and yep. it is now the second era and eh, 230 years into the second era ish and uh you've seen what all of this forbidden knowledge has done you've seen that there are a bunch of different groups of types of mages practicing different kinds of magic and then you also have seen that in general the organization the political organization the empire haven't necessarily been too happy with mages because they're you know they're a little nefarious they're a little secretive yeah what do you do yeah. what do you're vanis galarian and you're like oh, we got it we got to do something about this what do you decide to do maybe uh, i don't know maybe we kind of like uh turn it into like some type of schooling system and we make it uh moderately available to the masses <laughs> Okay, so you form the Mages Guild. Uh, you open it up. Basically, you say, hey, anybody who wants to do magic, come join our guild. We'll help educate you. But then do you just let them do whatever kind of magic they want? um you know we'll, we'll since we're doing it like a school we should probably govern exactly which things that people are allowed to learn and you know Mana Marco kind of uh being Mana Marco and us no longer being on the up and up like we were prior to I uh, think maybe stuff like necromancy should be uh outlawed uh <laughs> may, may, maybe Ray, maybe rein in exactly what people can learn and uh we definitely won't get too carried away as time goes on and restrict magical abilities uh you know past the point of reasonable 
extremes at any point right we'll, we'll totally totally not get corrupt in that regard right so um, that sounds like a good plan i'm sure that'll work 100 percent of the time yeah no that's probably what happens throughout the series too. <laughs> but it makes sense like neck uh you know having to do with necromancy necroma- necromantic magics yeah that's straight out like, they're they're a violation aside, straight out yeah they're a violation of the corpses of dead people and the things people carry about care about and they're kind of out there uh what do you say mr vanis galerian about um soul gems then how do you feel well, about soul gems you know i apparently i think that uh lesser creatures really are totally fine we can we can work with conjuration we can stuff them in all the soul gems we want but you know dealing with uh black soul gems is probably another no-go for us putting so, like uh, yeah like yeah, humans you know, and elves maybe, maybe and jamming other races. people or i don't know yeah competition from your class in a soul gem is not gonna be uh look too kindly on okay okay so we have some limitations here that's what you're saying uh some yeah yeah no i I think some i think some limitations again you know i really feel like i should just be the authority on what is allowed going forward for a while (laughs) okay all right well it's it's interesting because vanis lives a very long time uh man and marco extremely long i mean he's basically a lich at one point so yeah there's there's that um but here let's get into that that was actually a very good answer thank you thank you vanis galarian for joining us um so here let's let's dig into what the uesp you oh god uesp article says words are hard nailed it nailed it (laughs) nailing it um so yeah you are right that's exactly what he did now here's the details in the second era the mages guild was founded by vanis galarian in about the second era 230 as a way of centralizing magic and thus moving away from many separate groups like the sigic order of which galarian was a member that had dominated the study of magic until that time in fact the sigic order had already been falling out of grace with the society it's policy of isolationism led to mistrust and its religion best described as a type of ancestor worship was an increasingly unfashionable philosophy by the second era that's basically what we were talking about right you end up with this dilemma this group is not really accepted because they're not following the rest of society and they're very secretive so they're kind of on the out with the formation of the mages guild galarian spread knowledge of the magic arts to the layman selling magical items potions and scrolls to the general populace as such magic was no longer restricted to the aristocracy intelligent and or intelligentsia galarian named the office of high guild master the archmage or archmage however you want to pronounce that in memory of shalador the first recorded mage to claim the title you've probably heard of shalador before if you played I don't know any of the games <laughs> that name comes <laughs> up a lot pretty much any of them <laughs> pretty much any of them so um so basically he takes a situation and goes okay everyone's scared of magic and it's too removed from society let's bring people together around the idea that like magic can be safe if we educate it in a certain way if we right. make it socially acceptable and if we allow lay people to understand a little bit about what we're doing to buy potions or scrolls you know to kind of sure. spread the and magic love out in the world a little bit yeah and by doing doing so i mean that's that's applicable uh, applicable to so many things when you teach people how to use something responsibly so that it's not this just scary like uh, i don't know what to do with this and then you kind of just jabbing at it and uh, potential for screwing up is so much higher you you won't have that because it won't seem weird it will be something that people are kind of accustomed to dealing with so it's not going to just be freaking people out all the time if you can throw lightning bolts or whatever um so so in theory this this totally makes sense especially with trying to this should be able to you know technology is somewhat limited throughout the series mm-hmm. um whereas this is almost their form of technology you know what i mean like they don't have cell phones but then you know they have portals <laughs> it's like okay that's that seems pretty handy i mean yeah. having that ability to kind of use that as their form of advancement makes sense because the more people have access to that the more that they're able to do for better or worse sometimes. right right it's like it's like uh technology in our own world if only yeah. certain people have certain technology then that seems kind of secretive and magical and gives them a one-up on everyone else but if we right. all share knowledge and technology and it's all accessible to everybody then it kind of levels the playing field and makes it less scary um so 
this all went off without a hitch, right? Well, not exactly. Uh, mm-hmm. During the second era, there obviously were some leaders some, from some different groups who seemed to be upset with this idea, and they were like, well, this is a bad idea. And so, of course, they call Vanis Galarian to come and explain what he's doing. And either Vanis was very good at convincing all of them or very good at lying about and like downplaying the dangers of magic or or and or he also got the help from one of the leaders of this time period who is uh Rillis the uh 12th who's one of yes. these nobles and important people and Rillis ends up and this is kin lord Rillis who decides to stand up for valerian's point and pushes through basically the idea that like the mages guild should be allowed and it is now vetted and okay turns out that real is total total dark uh mage in the making and was interested in the kinds of advancements that realists could get from the knowledge in order to do other terrible things so right. uh, again with with knowledge you know you got to have a degree of responsibility that goes along with that which that becomes very, very specific to the type of people you're dealing with, which is really hard when you're trying to make something accessible. That does mean that although many people will use it for good, uh, other people will probably use it for their own selfish means or whatever. Yeah. Now, speaking about use for good or for evil, the Mages Guild is founded and it proliferates in the Somerset Isles at first and eventually makes its way out into the continent as other places open up their own mages guilds and eventually it was incorporated into the capital of the empire and so you have this kind of uh, transition phase of the mages guild moving focus to the empire and the you know the being associated with the emperor and all of the stuff coming from the center of tamriel in order to kind of give them a little bit more leverage over those things uh and then you have events that happen in eso we're not going to go over a ton of those things but you've got the soul burst you've got all this other stuff going on in eso and guess what they needed in order to help push back molek ball and all of the terribleness well they needed people who were good fighters they needed people who knew how to handle magic and they decided to send a bunch of them over to cold harbor in order to fight back <laughs> against mulling ball so yep. mage's guild it pays off by the by the fifth century by the end mid end, to end of the well i guess it'd be sixth century of the second era because now you have a bunch of trained mages who can actually stand up against all of the terribleness that was happening so right and and you know you having battle mages becomes like integral to so many different factions um throughout the history of all of the games like it just it becomes to a degree the norm like to have them as like you know trained scholars and it honestly like viewing it as a school it, it's kind of interesting because you get both the side effects of that where it comes with a degree of status to a lot of um mages like it's you know it's like okay you know you've essentially got your degree in magic when you go to these schools which is kind of interesting because in some of the games which ironically later in the series of the timeline but earlier in the series numerically (laughs) um like arena and daggerfall um the mages guild definitely come across as uh, you know it was still early in the series formation they actually since the sigics really hadn't become fleshed out in the series we had mentioned that they you know there was kind of restricted to skyrim and and um yeah they show up in the text but we didn't really get a whole really a view of them until skyrim exactly so uh, with the original formation of the the mages guild in those earlier games a lot of time you kind of got a lot more influence of they kind of have the traits of both of them because when you accept quests for the mages guild which i've actually been doing in my playthrough in daggerfall they treat you like total pond scum for quite a while (laughs) right until you you gotta earn your way up exactly and and they're very it's kind of funny they definitely come across as these like eccentric oftentimes like total just like oh i'm lost in my own thought because of all these things and it's like well we, what did i tell you to do again or that yeah 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 that's fine figure it out it's it, you, you know i can't be bothered with these trivial problems when i have these more elaborate problems and it's funny because they definitely um had it had a more mixed feel in the older games 
But then as they uh, advanced in the series, it definitely seemed like it had a little more acceptance of like, okay, they got the split going. So it was like, okay, well, yes, the idea to them is, you know, a little more accepting to the general population, at least most of the time, I think. Yeah. Now, and Rob, the princess makes a good point in chat Uh, because of the bringing together of certain magic types of magic into the mages guild that also create a situation where they outlawed other ones or the other types of magics just didn't get taught didn't get spread right, didn't get if shared you're not teaching them they kind of become lost to his point like, right it, kind of it, like a language even... right like if you define a certain yes. language as the primary language of a culture then eventually right. the other indigenous languages or other you know minority variations on those languages eventually kind of go away they fade into the background yeah. um so things like and rob points out shadow magic reach magic ancient yep. iliad rituals uh, there's a we've gone over a number i mean the stuff the sigics knew uh there's right. a bunch it, of stuff yeah. out there that we see druidic magic we get a, a lot of that stuff in the series um well, all of those things then, kind of fall outside the mages guild and to to jump off that and go into more of my my domain of like the gameplay mechanics in general it's kind of funny because for gameplay reasons they've also changed the way schools are distributed um you know one game you'll have mysticism but in another game you might not like the way they're classified changes based on what game you're playing which is kind of interesting because the schools become this sort of nebulous thing of like Mm -hmm. what type of magic goes in what school because it can be different from game to game yeah it gets redefined so like the meta the meta perspective is that they redefine it depending on how they want gameplay to work out in the game exactly but Um, the narrative inside the world is that the mages guild lasts for centuries and centuries and centuries sometimes they just reorganize in different ways or or whatever and and the biggest one obviously being like with the levitation act um which is funny because it, it was you know designed for logistical reasons of programming um are we talking about where, in morrowind and for, from so morrowind, morrowind to oblivion could, yeah, yeah from morrowind to oblivion from that point on the levitation act was passed where you literally can't use levitation anymore like that spell needed to be taken out of the games because the way that you would load into cities was entirely different <laughs> right um, right it breaks and, the games and, and similar and all to these game issues. like so they in, needed part of the lore right they literally was like no no no, no more levitation that's that can't be doing that right similar to like having flying mounts in like world of warcraft or something Ooh, like they have to right. design the zones so that it works for flying mounts but then also the quest lines change like it makes questing so much easier if you just drop just into the place you're supposed you to, go, to go and you don't have to like fight your way through the path because you have to yeah, walk exactly yeah so right. so that plays out differently so we move into like the third era and now we have uh battle mages which you mentioned who are now in integral to the empire and their yep. their methods and all of that yep. you Often have trained in the battle spire womp womp <laughs> there you go <laughs> right um you have uh the reemergence of men and marco the reemergence of restrictions on necromancy the fact that some of the guild members turn to start worshiping sanguine which is interesting but it, it just shows that over time like these are groups of people the the guild works fundamentally different as time moves on society changes yep. and different kinds of people make different decisions so you've got a lot of that stuff that goes on and that's right. you know in some of the games and then we have the fourth era during the oblivion crisis and then after which leads into the fourth era and the mages guild was dissolved due to strong anti-magic sentiment after the oblivion crisis so yeah. that's why in skyrim we have the college of winterhold and that's where you find all the magic stuff but there's no mages guild right and and that's kind of where it becomes i i can't i guess when you want to look at it like in most rudimentary way i can think of it's like okay well since the overall like network of like them is no longer a thing so you could say that their accreditation is gone <laughs> you you now just have this community college essentially that you're going to where it's just like yeah well we're we're kind of doing our own thing we're out in the middle of nowhere yeah barely uh, hanging on the edge of the continent literally <laughs> hanging on by, by, <laughs> by, by a thread a, like on a cliff edge yeah, like right um and that's that's like you know wh- where you're going to study and at that point it's weird because like even still 
that college is sort of feared again. Like you get an era that people are uneasy around them because right. it's mm -hmm. regressed. Like it's like, okay, like it's not becoming the norm. And now people are starting to become cautious of what they might not know or understand again. Right, right. So that's the historical extent of it. The organizational structure is interesting, too, because it's led by an archmage. Uh, and there's a, a council of mages made up, made up of six arch magisters or arch magisters, uh, one of whom is the archmage. And by the third era, the archmage and the council of mages were headquartered in the arcane, uni uni uh, arcane university in the imperial city. And the council decided important guild policies, such as its policy to use necromancy or not use necromancy. Uh, it administered recruitment, sales of spells at guild halls, enforcement of guild law, and the rules of guilds varied from locations to location. This part of the variance that we were talking about. Some differences were more dr drastic than others. In addition, guild halls existed in most cities in Tamriel, each of which was run by a local guild magister, alternatively known as a hall magister. So you've got kind of these different rankings, right? And then below him were the master of, here we go, funny words, incunabula, alternatively uh -huh. called the high incunabulist, and the master Perfect. of arms. The master of incunabula had a council of two the master of academia and the master of the scry scrying is a thing you could do in eso right right the master of arms also had a council the master of initiates and the palatinus the leader of the local chapter of the order of the lamp the order of the lamp were the they were kind of the militarized part of the group that protected the mages guild so you had kind of this hierarchy and all of these different levels and organization that set up the structures and all the different guild halls. So that's right. kind of how it all worked. You, you kind of, if you did this long enough, you would work yourself into a certain position, then you have a role in the guild, and then you might move up to the position above that, and eventually you might become Archmage. So that's the structure. That's how it works. And of course, yeah. everything went super swell all the time, and nobody was ever mad at the guild or uh, no, banished them from the combat. Yeah, they definitely disbanded because they were just so tired of being successful. That was the reason. That was the reason. That was the reason. <laughs> but, you know, when the world gets attacked by a uh, Daedric Prince that opens portals all over the place, and you start becoming a little bit more scared about magic because the guy down the street can also summon Daedra to do his lawn. Right. Right. <laughs> so. And actually, uh, one thing that is, is kind of a good point to just make a note of that rob brought up um the the viewpoints actually would likely differ a bit too depending upon where exactly you are discussing this stuff right um, because right. again some regions you know what with altmer specifically they're they're much more naturally in tuned with magicka so it's probably like since it's integrated so much more in their culture even when you know you have the mages guild disbanding or or something like that or whatever the case it's probably still likely more common to find an acceptance sure. of magicka yeah well um, look at the thalmor in those regions exactly yeah like, with the thalmor exactly like, like the thalmor are all like most of those like you fight them you come across them in skyrim and they start throwing yeah. fireballs at you like it totally right, makes right. sense like but yep. those those mages of the thalmor are probably probably not part of the mages guild because the Correct. mages guild was dissolved and mm -hmm. the thalmor probably don't want to divide their interests between a guild and managing their own rules and structure well, for yeah i was, I was gonna mages. say the felmore wanting to take any instruction from anyone except themselves is right. highly unlikely right right and i i think that to another point um it fell out of favor with the empire so the empire yes. in general the culture of the empire is like no more mages guild but that doesn't mean that like somewhere like like uh i don't know high rock where sure. again magic is a little bit more common among the populace that they still aren't doing magic but the right. organization it's just, itself probably still doesn't exist it's there. not it's not this centralized body that it used to be right right so there's all of that all right well that's that's kind of the history and the organization we're going to take a break and thank our patrons and when we get back we're going to talk about some of the types of magic that are generally approved of and how they seem to be defined usually and then of course which ones are kind of on the out which the list isn't very long but we're going to go over that when we get back all right don't go anywhere see you on the other side this is a mystery. Morak Dragonborn. 
and you are educating yourself to the Elder Scrolls lore cast. All right, here we are. This is the part of the show where we get to thank our patrons, including, we've got a bunch of new ones, uh, Juan, Ghost Armor X, Raven, Stigmus Septimus, upgraded to a tier four patron, so they can join us on the patron chat coming up next week. Uh, then we have Cody D and Bryson S. Welcome to the Patreon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And shout outs to our Daedric Princes, Jacob K., Kira C and Noodle Al Dente. And thank you to all 129 of our current patrons. We can do this without you. So thank you for being here and supporting the show. If we're helping you get through your work week, if we're making your commute better, if we're maybe you have an infant and you like to listen to us while you rock the baby to sleep. I don't know where that <laughs> the now, that's version. I feel of like my voice is from. not prone to helping with any of that. <laughs> then uh, thank you for being here. And if you want to join us for the patron chat next week, all of that stuff is available at patreon.com slash L. Elder Scrolls Lorecast. You can help us out and get ad free episodes or join us next week. At We normally record this on Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. We will be doing the same thing next week. And let's see, it's the 22nd today. So that means the 29th. 29th. I can't believe we're already at the end of June. I know time goes by. And so if you want to join us, feel free to to join up on there, connect your Patreon account to Discord, and then it'll open up the channel in Discord where we all discuss what things we're going to discuss. We discuss before we do the discussion on the actual recorded episode. So uh, lots of fun stuff you can join us with there and um, hope you hope you decide to go check it out. Also, Lotus, we got a new review in. This one is from the Blind Orc in the United States. Uh, I'm not sure how they type if they're blind, but maybe they have with, don't with, you, aren't there keyboards? Braille screen? Aren't there braille keyboards? Isn't that a thing? I have no, probably. I think I maybe mean, there would, are. Yeah, that's yeah, a probably. thing, right? Yeah, All right, I so would assume so. The blind orc using a braille keyboard wrote, one of the best ES podcasts ever, five stars. It's just such a good podcast to listen to, whether you are at work, curious about the lore, or even just want some inspiration to create a new character. Not only is the <laughs> podcast itself just great, the community is probably, in my experience, one of the most friendly out there. I've had so many times where I ask a simple question and end up getting a full-fledged informational conversation and debate that feels like it could be a podcast on its own. <laughs> Our listeners are like super engaged with this stuff, which is, I, yeah, which I is awesome. I, I love that. Uh, and then it goes on and says, not to mention that the host himself, Tom, is completely active in the community and will often add to these debates. It's an it's a great thing. Lotus does, too, by the way. Uh, it's a and great. Elder so because I don't check Discord as much. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it depends on how busy I am when things pop that's, up. I'm that's like, kind uh, of my thing. quick answer. I, I was, since I don't have a uh, since I don't have a desk job, I don't actually have. I, it's whenever I can look at my phone. So right. a lot of times I get to just read everything. I'm like, oh, look at all the stuff. <laughs> oh, look at everybody else having all these conversations at their desk jobs. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a great Elder Scrolls resource, and I would completely, all in caps, recommend listening. P.S. Completely deserves being in the top one percent of podcasts. So well, thank you very Aww. much. Yeah, that is that is one of the stats. Kind. We've been in the top one percent for like I don't know two years now, or something like that. Um, so very very kind of you. Thank you for taking the time to do that. And if you decide that you would like to leave us an Apple Podcast review and give us five stars, we'll read it out on a future show. You don't have to listen on Apple Podcasts. You just have to have an account yeah. and then log in and leave the review. So that's totally another way to help us out. Also, you can rate us on Spotify or whatever other podcast you're listening to us on. So that's what we've got for the mid show break. Let's move on with the rest of the show. You're listening to the Elder Scrolls Lorecast, dear child of cities. That is why the Night Mother loves you. All right, so Lotus, are you ready for this? I'm going to read through some of the things that get taught and their definition. I was going to say, are we going into some schools of magic here? Yeah, so uh, this article, this part of the article on the US, UESP about the mages guild is particularly interesting because it goes into its teachings it says yep. here many of the greatest mages graduated from the mages guild this was partly due the, to the guild's prominence in tamriel and open-ended recruitment policy the mages guild encouraged all mages of varying skill and interest to join and promoted an active regiment of practicing one's chosen spells to gain mastery over their specific school of magic right so it implies that a lot of mages like focused in on certain schools more than others yeah makes the, sense yeah the mages guild taught its students to use magic and various ways from conjuration to elemental daedra to alchemy 
to dark magic, which was taught at times. After several centuries, this aggregation of magical research and knowledge became haphazard and disorganized, and a nude model based on the Shad Astula Academy's curricula was proposed by Gabriel Benel around the time of the Three Banners War. While the specific schools changed over the centuries, seven major schools of spellcasting and two other schools of arcane arts were taught extensively by the Mages Guild, proving, providing students with a better structure to learn the concept of wizardry in half the time of the old curricula. It sounds like a like a marketing speech about like that literally sounds like you're you know why you're trying to market that people should come to your school right come to the mages guild we'll teach <laughs> you all the good the stuff and Here's none of our... the really bad stuff yeah I don't... But, but maybe <laughs> still the bad stuff yeah um <laughs> so all right so we have alteration and i've got dogs barking uh, alteration spells alter the physical and magical properties of the target, making objects heavier or lighter, granting elemental or physical shields, bestowing the ability to breathe under and walk on water and open locks. Pretty handy. Pretty handy. Pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, um, pretty straightforward. Now, levitation would probably be thrown out under this one. Like that's. Is that an alteration I think so. spell? I think that some of these feel like there's a little bit of crossover. There, there's definitely some overlap, and it's why a lot of times it seems like they kind of jump from school to school. <laughs> right. And so maybe levitation, maybe you can make yourself lighter, but I don't know that you'd make yourself lighter than air. I feel like there's better ways to levitate than that right. method. Right. So here, let's move on. Conjuration spells call upon otherworldly entities like conjuring the Daedra, that kind of thing. Through telepathy and certain skilled conjuration mages can develop telepathic links with each other. Conjuration spells augment the caster by granting them Daedric and Undead Guardians, Daedric weapons and armor, and the ability to repel the undead. You can see how Conjuration sometimes, and we've talked about this before, borders on necromancy. Yeah, it, it's like right on the cut. Again, it's it's where do you draw the distinction for this? Um, yeah. And, and yeah, it's, it definitely seems like one of the gray schools. Yeah, like conjuring like ghost chicken to protect you on your quest. And that's not so terrible. Conjuring your long dead brother to get vengeance on his killer. Yeah, it's a little bit more sketchy. Uh, little, yeah, a little, little more, little more suspect. <laughs> All right, destruction magic, which sounds wholesome. Uh, these spells harm the target by damaging its health with either elemental or magical attacks, draining and damaging its attributes, skills, health, magic, and fatigue, making it weaker to the elements, poisons, and magic, and corroding its armor and weapons. So, basically anything that breaks something down. Yes. So, not a whole lot to say about that. That's fireballs right. and lightning and all that kind of stuff. Uh, illusion. Illusion. Nobody in Ew. the United States says illusion, but... <laughs> I will. Uh, All right. I no, we're going to allow it. <laughs> spells uh, affect light and a sentient target's mind. They can harm the target by commanding, demoralizing, paralyzing, silencing, and causing it to frenzy or augmenting it by rallying, charming, calming it, granting it invisibility, night vision, translucency, and illuminating it. Yeah. So, so you like, yeah, I mean, at least in terms of like causing frenzy or demoralizing, it's like using, you know, Twitter to have a debate or something like that. That would be a form <laughs> of illusion. Right. Do, do you ever, okay, so a few thoughts here. Do, do you use the spells that like send enemies into frenzy when you play like so, Skyrim? Because I don't, I've tried doing it. I just never really. Some of my friends do. Um, I, I've seen some of my friends do it before and it seems like a really cool play style but I am a very straightforward play style, so I tend not to. Mm -hmm. The only thing with illusion that I always do get a lot of use for is I don't like carrying torches. Yeah. So yeah. I always tend to use illusion to see. Um, I use the the light version of it where right. I manipulate that. You get the That's little light the that most... floats around you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, or or uh, recently in Daggerfall, it literally makes a, a candle that just floats in front of your screen <laughs> and it That's just great. says your character's name on the candle because it's your summon. That's funny. Um, That's funny. Yeah, but but like that's more of what I use it for. However, a lot of times I, illusion seems like you can do some cool stuff with it especially if you like 
if you're into conjuration, you can essentially conjure stuff and then frenzy people that then you have essentially more minions under your control because then they'll go attack your enemies theoretically, or yeah. you can cause people to chill out or whatnot. So it's, it's, it's definitely got some interesting play styles to it. None of which tend to be really something I use uh, an awful lot though. Right. Right. So I, I also think that there's some really cool distinction here between alteration and illusion. Alteration yeah. is changing the thing itself. Right. So if you wanted to say, you know, the, to, like maybe you got a glass ball and you want to make the glass ball shine light, that would be alteration because you're altering the way the glass ball sure. affects light, or, right? Uh, yeah. Illusion affects the mind. Yeah. So you think that ball is producing light, right? But it's not actually right. So like maybe I want to convince everybody that this ball is shining light, but right. I don't. I'm not an alteration mage, but I can exactly. cast an illusion spell that convinces everybody's brains that that thing's casting light. Correct. So yeah. it might as well be casting light, at least to the people who are witnessing. Exactly, because what they're seeing the looks like that. So yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's overlap, but in a different way of from overlap in what you can do with it, but done in different ways. Right, right. And it's, it's basically mind magic. So that's yeah. just one of those distinctions that you don't think about very often, but that's actually what that is. Right. Uh, then we have mysticism. This is one that shows up in some of the games. Yeah, it, this one's a little more bizarre yeah it's an obscure school though its spells seem to manipulate magicka itself with spells that bind the target's soul this school is closely related to necromancy spells can augment the target by granting it the ability to detect life reflect damage absorb and reflect spells or harm it by dispelling its magical effects and trapping its soul spells can also move objects through space with telekinesis the nature of the school of mysticism is subject to much scholarly debate so this one seems like one of those uh it definitely treads a bunch of lines yeah like some of these abilities seem like they should be in other schools but i have to wonder mysticism being something that say the sigics tapped into that I wonder if mysticism actually is fundamentally a different type. It's not a school of magic. It's a different type of magic itself. And right. I'm making that distinction between like, let's say alteration, destruction, illusion, conjuration, a lot of the ones we've talked about, they all use like ethereal power, like the power that comes from Ethereus, right? Through yeah. like the sun, like that source of magic. Let's call that traditional magica. I right. feel like those kinds of things are traditional spells because they use traditional magica in order to cast. And although effectively in some of the games you use magica to use mysticism spells as well, it's almost like it, there's a different source of uh, a core source to the, either the method of creating the magic or the source of power for the magic. That make it distinct and different kind of like um shadow magic or yeah like like that power is bestowed from somewhere else if that makes sense that's the right. I mean, it's just a feel i don't have this is not core lore this is just no no it's a it's feeling a feeling i yeah. have it, it, it's sort of and i can see that because like the other thing is again this one like we mentioned obscure is a good way of putting this because sometimes it's things that are put into mysticism become parts of other skill lines uh right like other other schools in different games because mysticism is not in all the games right um, right so, so like yeah there, there's there's a little bit of manipulation going on with that and one of the ones that is is super useful and in, in regards to like i guess like moving the object like you itself like your soul is part of it one of the things that is super useful for mysticism as was mentioned um when, you, when you're manipulating the market recall as a spell mm -hmm. where you literally are able to teleport your being around like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm marked here. Well, I'm over here now. I want to go back. So you literally are like, and they're like back. There. It's like that's moving you physically like and your being back to a previous location, which is, again, kind of weird as opposed to like. This is, you know, this light glows. It's like, okay, well, this is literally moving your person <laughs> right. and existence right. around if, the world. It feels like a different, like, level of magic. It, it, right, it's right, a, right. It's a different class in itself. Yep. Um, so we've got mysticism. Then we've got uh, restoration, which grants the target uh, 
which I'm sorry, augments the target by restoring its health, attributes, stamina, and magicka, fortifying its health, attributes, skills, stamina, and magicka, granting its resistances to elements, magic, disease, paralysis, poison, and unenchanted weapons, curing it of disease, poison, and paralysis, or harm the target by absorbing its health, magicka, stamina, attributes, and skills. So basically, yeah. it's almost like if you if you really, really look at the detail of what's happening here, restoration is about funneling energy from one place to another or blocking the transmission of energy yeah so like I, my health is low math. yeah it's so like, i'm gonna heal this up it's you it's you i'm taking magic energy influence. and filling up my health with it so yeah. i'm now channeling that energy into health right. i'm channeling that energy into stamina or i'm i'm my now creating fell off i need to starfish my arm back on so <laughs> right it's like... right or i'm channeling that energy in order to block things that would be harmful to my health sure. like poison or something like that right um, so it's it's basically manipulating energy as either filling what's not there or you know fixing what's not there or yep. blocking the harm from something else or yeah, yeah, exactly. or draining something else so like for example curing an undead dead creature would be removing the undeadness from it right so you got kind of that sort of thing going on too uh, then we have thaumaturgy which is a wonderful word. This does not change the appearance or structure of an object or force, but can manipulate laws temporarily. This allows thaumaturges to perform acts which can be achieved through brute force in other schools of magic, such as levitation, etherealness, detection, pacification, water walking, teleportation, summoning, and the manipulation of other magical forces. So again, another one that's not prominent to every, every yeah, game. Uh, yeah. And these these oftentimes get put into other categories, be they alteration, mysticism, stuff like that. They, they kind of this school in the older games was a little more prominent, but then kind of got condensed into some other schools. Right. With the, with the spells. The, the core concept here is that it manipulates laws temporarily. So so right. for example, like maybe you could make somebody levitate by uh, making them, I don't know, light enough to float on air, right? Sure. That would be alteration. Uh, or maybe you temporarily suspend gravity around them and now yeah. they levitate. And then now it's right? thaumaturgy. That's the law it's... of gravity, which has been suspended by thaumaturgy rather than right. alteration. So, so same effect, different way of going about it. Again, like right. we had mentioned otherwise, where it's sometimes the schools, you can, you can obtain the same effect oftentimes through different means. Right. Just like um, in the real world, like we absolutely people are constantly. So I mean, if, if heck, if you are coding right now, if you're somebody who codes any you know, websites or video games or whatever, there are you will know there are multiple ways to get the same result absolutely. through different methods. Um, so same kind of thing, right? Yeah. I mean, I and that's kind of almost like the way the games have long been to get to your end point of whatever you're trying to do oftentimes there's a lot of ways to do it there isn't just like a this is the only build you can use to succeed at this it's just like yeah here's an open world just get there and yeah, there's the so beauty. many options it's like the beauty of the series this is the i mean it's the beauty of everything star or everything bethesda's Bethesda, main it's just so main development open does. Yeah. with so many options to get to your right. end result yeah starfield's going to be the same way which i'm super excited about uh, which by the way posted a new article we got we got a new interview mm -hmm. with todd and a bunch of new information starfield insider if you want to go read it on a website uh starfield lorecast if you want to listen to it a bunch of cool new info about how this kind of stuff is going to happen in starfield so um and not necessarily magic but like the way that the world works and being able to you know, go, go magic, through your goal nah. go to your goal in multiple ways right like all that kind of stuff um all right so then two more alchemy is the act of mixing boiling and distilling various substances to obtain their chemo magical properties and create potions and poisons so this is the equivalent of chemistry in the world of elder scrolls yeah. it yeah it, it's objectively chemistry and it's just called alchemy which is a parallel to the real world a lot of times it was called alchemy and right traditionally alchemy times. was about trying to turn things into gold uh, right that but was the, the idea was kind of to yeah make a profit off it but um <laughs> which i guess you could argue chemistry sort of does well whatever <laughs> <laughs> sure and then there's enchanting enchanting is the act of endowing objects with magical properties through the use of a soul almost always with the use of a soul gem the effects of uh, the effects of enchanted apparel may augment the wearer and the effects of enchanted weapons may harm the target 
So yeah, yeah. So now we're getting into what powers this magic, and and again, like this is different. Like right. enchanting is powered by soul magic. The like restoration is empowered by magica. Like, right. Those are and not the two same energy sources. They're different. No. And it's where things get a little dicey when it comes into what we'll be talking about in a minute when what you're not supposed to be using because it's specifically no. Um, <clears throat> but then in regards to oftentimes you need to have conjuration in order to soul trap the items you need in order to then use the souls for enchanting. So they kind of go hand in hand that way. So again, sometimes these, you know, almost rely on each other to accomplish what they need to be done. Right now, the um, there are a number of different magics that will not get. We, we aren't just going to go back over here because they just are ignored by the guild. Right? Yeah, like a druidic magic and uh, the right. reachman and and I mean yeah, heck, reach, even yeah, the thum or sword singing or hedge magic. Like all of these are different types of magic, but they're not <laughs> included in the mages guild uh right often for different reasons some of them are more dangerous some of them are more specific to certain cultures that didn't yeah weren't there when the mages guild was founded and weren't necessarily right. part and, of the empire and for the most part they're not oh usually they're not overtly like no you absolutely can't do this it's just we're not going to teach this and you know it's just not on our radar it's I guess just would be it, it doesn't feel like it's part of the culture of the, like the mainline mages it feels right. like these are subcultures and so of course if you're you know highly educated mage you're a little bit snooty you're going to be like hedge magic Pff, why would we teach that you know like sure those are savages <laughs> it's like okay well maybe it's just a different way of doing something like i don't know yeah right um, right so Aside from those, there's, of course, the two that when we were when we were playing at the beginning, there's necromancy, which most of the time is not included in the major. Yeah, that's going to be a hard no for the most part. For the most part. Necromancy is largely just super frowned on. um, And then, you know, you combine necromancy with, you know, the dark arts If we were joking about black soul gems as opposed to. Any yeah. other soul gem type of thing. Well, soul gems pose, pose a big problem because one of the things that's common in Elder Scrolls is that soul gems are easy to make. They're all right. over the place. They're harder to fill, but they're easier to make. So if you fill a soul gem using conjuration and let's say let's say you're a farmer and your pig dies and you go, well, we don't want the pig to go to waste. So we we're going to we're going to yeah. we're going to eat the pig we're like gonna the pig's going to be and trap be dinner soul fraternity and I'm right. going to power my we're gonna, with it. Right. We're going to make some other things out of the pig parts that are useful. We'll use the bones. We'll use the skin yeah. like like anybody in most of human history would have done because most of us would sure. have been farmers. You're going to use everything that's available in some way. Well, the only the other part of the pig that's available available to people in Tamriel is the pig's soul and so you're going to trap it in a soul gem or you'll go to the mages guild you'll have one of the mages come out trap it in a soul gem for you for a certain amount of money yeah. and now you've got a little battery that you right. can use to do whatever you wanted to do that needs soul magic exactly. in order to power it which is really screwed up when you think about it bring an oinky to the you know mages guild and then turning him into a battery for your like I said, I don't know, your Dwemer lawnmower or whatever. It's like, right. OK, maybe let Oinky just rest. <laughs> right. So over time, most people were OK with this because eh, it's a pig or whatever. Um, but some some mages were, you know, the, the kind the percentage of people in our own world that go, I'm not going to eat it, eat meat anymore because I don't like what that does to animals. Sure. We're probably going to have problems with salt and white soul magic. Right. Yeah. But there are people who are okay with that the majority are tend to be okay because the trade-off is so beneficial to society this ability sure. to use this magic to power stuff but then come the black soul gems and the idea that you can you know trap another person yeah my neighbor's an asshole so he is now <laughs> going to power my tv and you can see why this is a lot more of a problem because basically you are condemning somebody's soul to a form of hell <laughs> trapped within yeah. a gem and that becomes a problem uh in some cultures it was more common to say like oh beast folk aren't really people so we can use their souls right but and isn't the fact that all beast folk souls are black souls just like humans or elves yeah isn't that proof that they're people isn't that literally showing that they're the same quality of soul when you're when you're right. doing the the i don't know the, the the checking in on hierarchy of soul quality it's like you objectively are in the same grouping right it's, it doesn't matter if you put larry down the street in the soul gem or if you put 
you know, uh, I can't think of a good Khajiit name. Uh, <laughs> or, or Argonian. Licks his yeah. paws or whatever uh, over here and, and put them. Like, they're the same. Hisses their souls soul work the same way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, that, that becomes a problem. And, of course, they outlaw those. And so next time you're playing a game and you're like, oh, cool. Black soul gems. These are really powerful. Think about whose mom is in there. Well, also, so <laughs> the ironic thing, just from a gameplay standpoint, it does it is pretty amusing that a black soul gem has like the like it's basically just grand quality so it's the equivalent of just a grand soul gem so it it is kind of funny that it's just like this one's just specific to like yeah okay you get squished into this one where you wouldn't get squished into a standard grand soul gem but the quality of the soul is technically the same in game right right so yeah it's, there's a little there's some fuzzy edges on the stuff but um yeah so this is cool because there's a document called guild memo on soul trapping by vanis galarian and we're going to wrap up this episode with this from vanis galarian arc magister emeritus if you pay attention to the popular fads and fashions of spell casting in your guild halls you have doubtless noticed the recent resurge of interest in the discipline of soul trapping. Unlike most of the passing fancies that come and go among the magical fraternity, I consider this particular vogue alarming and dangerous. <laughs> there are reasons why soul trapping has never been a part of the core curriculum of the Mages Guild. Taught to only the most experienced and dependable wizards, and then only for certain specific uses. First of all, it is technically a subset of necromancy, and on that basis alone, it should not it should be abhorred. Except, as mentioned, for certain special cases, and then only under controlled conditions. Second, it is a magical technology that practically invites abuse, especially when employed to trap the souls of sentient mortals. It is the sort of arcane practice that the public fears most and is likely to result in local bans on the, on the organized teaching of magic. And if that happens, all our work in establishing the guild will have been in vain. The fact that soul trapping is now common knowledge among Tamriel's majory to the point where so-called mystics sell soul gems of various sizes in every market and bazaar is a problem that can be laid squarely the feet of iniquitous of the iniquitous Manimarco and his order of the black worm. It is all part of his program to make necromancy seem commonplace and almost harmless. In some parts of Tamriel, notably Cyrodiil, the vile practice of necromancy has even become accepted as a valid and legally tolerated magical discipline. While our old mentor Iachesis, Iachesis probably, would have to say about what he would have to say about this per pernicious development, I hate to think. But what are we to do about it? I have been given the matter some hard thought in between rooting out cells of the ever burgeoning worm cult. And I think at this point, the only way to gain control over soul trapping is to co-opt the practice. Therefore, I propose the Mages Guild codify and systematize the various soul trapping magics into a common grimoire of a few reliable spells and then teach our members that these and only these are the legal and authorized methods for soul trapping. Furthermore, I propose that for the purposes of soul trapping, we categorize all souls into two classes, the legal or white souls, those smaller essences that are captured from beasts and animals and illegal or black souls, which are derived from sentient mortals. And we will teach only those spells that can capture white souls, forbidding our students to use the larger soul gems on sentience. It will take several generations and the suppression of the worm cult for this dichotomy to become the pan Tamrielic standard for soul trapping. But if the Mages Guild can't take the long view on the good of Tamriel, who can? <laughs> this is so good because it shows <laughs> it shows the connection to necromancy. It shows that yep. like Man of Market was trying to leverage popular appeal for something right. that was so beneficial to make them more OK with necromancy socially. <laughs> yeah. All of that is so cool. <laughs> Lotus is just like nodding his head. He's like, "Yep." Yeah, yep. it's it's just it it, it is. It's, it's very it's it's funny because it's kind of brought up in chat too. It's all very very political to push forward which agenda. Essentially, in this case, Mana Marco is really like, okay, Mana Mar uh, necromancy is my like field of interest. 
but nobody else really wants this to be okay. How can I make this so that everybody thinks, Hey, no, look, 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 it's not so bad. Like, I really just want to study this. Just yeah. let me study this. I totally won't abuse all of this power. Right. Which we'll, we'll just give everybody, you know, Dwemer lawnmowers with, uh, soul gems to power them. Yeah, and then exactly. they'll, they'll get used to the right. idea. Yeah. Yeah. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. So <laughs> that's the origin of the mages guild and, um, some of the other details about what they've been teaching and kind of their structure and stuff. Any yeah, other thoughts? Before we, thought. Yeah. Any other thoughts before we head out? Those? No, actually I, I, that was good. I was, we kind of got to cover all the different things, which I, I liked because that one with the mages guild, it allowed us to cover a lot of the things like schools of magic and stuff like that. That's, you know, so prevalent throughout the games and, as opposed to doing a thing on just like schools of magic, it ties in so much to this mm -hmm. and you know, what kind of is determined by an organization like the mages guild that, you know, is the quote unquote governing body when it comes to schools of magic a lot of time. Right. And it also shows why so many other types of magic we come across are not widely understood or taught about is because they're just not included in the mages guild. Yeah. So it leaves a lot of, opportunity for writing out storylines that play into other things and more mysterious parts of magic and all of that so that's that's fun too but yeah, uh, exactly yeah but that, that's it for this week thank you for being here everybody we'll be back next week with our patron chat so if you'd like to join us there's still time to sign up on the patreon and uh, lotus you had anything else you want to share before we head out um no not really i've just been excited to uh, play necrom um and yeah we'll be doing another episode of tales for anybody who likes the other show that we do that's kind of discussing like the news and stuff like that about um well any of the games but you know the live service game of elder scrolls online tends to be the biggest topic um but yeah I, it's just been uh man i i just wish i had more game time because so far i am really really loving necrom now that it's on console that's awesome that's awesome yeah i need to i need to play through the storyline um and one of the things i've been debating is streaming it if i can if i've got time to do that but then yep. also if i'm going to be recording that turning that into kind of episodes again like i you know, did a oh, while yeah, back yeah, yeah. Yep. um you know like turning that into maybe audio or video let me know if you uh, if you guys are still interested in that sort of thing i'd love to know because it's it takes a certain amount of work to produce it so i don't want to put a lot of work into something that most people are gonna be like yeah i'll skip those episodes so if you're interested in that if that sounds like something you'd like to either watch on youtube watch the streams on twitch or listen to the audio version please let me know because i want to i want to give you guys what you want and if you don't want it then i'll focus my efforts somewhere else so sure. Awesome. Uh, also, all the shows that we do, robotsradio.net is a wonderful place to go look for them. I mentioned the Starfield Lorecast. Lots of cool news coming about that, like every day almost. So go check out that. The most recent three episodes have a whole bunch of really cool new info. And uh, that is now we're trying to do those weekly. So lots of cool stuff over there. And thank you for being here, everybody. We will see you next week when we're chatting with our patrons. And until then, stay safe out there. Bye, everybody. See you later. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach me on Twitter at robots underscore radio or Lotus of Doom at Lotus of Doom. Also, you can join us on the Robots Radio Discord channel. You can easily just search Robots Radio Discord on Google or check the description underneath the podcast. Also, this podcast is recorded live every week on Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific on the Robots Radio channels on Twitch, YouTube, and on Facebook. So just search Robots Radio on any of those platforms come join us we'd love to chat with you while we record the show or before or after either way just come hang out with us and if you're looking for more information about my shows and the shows on the robots radio network go to robotsradio.net for all the information about all the shows on the network including the robots radio rocket club where i help both new and existing podcasters to grow their shows build their audiences and create the best podcast they possibly can all of that at robotsradio.net we'll see you next time